Good afternoon. So today we will continue with our topic that is managing digital business infrastructure. Uh, last time, before I ended the session, I had just started talking about uh, application programming interfaces where we saw a lot of companies uh, these days are uh, providing protocols, tools, and procedures and routines that allow developers to create software that are capable of interacting with their uh, platforms. We, we saw companies such as uh, Amazon doing that, which allows uh, software developers to, to create applications or uh, websites that can interact with uh, uh, Amazon uh, platform. For instance, uh, through our a API, it is possible to, to, to integrate uh, information about Amazon products on your, on your website. And that is because Amazon has provided uh, tools, uh, protocols, and procedures, and routines uh, to other people that can build a, uh, applications are, are around the uh, Amazon platform. We also saw Facebook and Twitter are doing the same uh, through its uh, API. Facebook has been able to create a, a huge ecosystem uh, uh, in the internet by allowing developers to create applications that can uh, communicate with Facebook platform. They can access data from uh, Facebook and that allows uh, Facebook to expand its presence on the internet, and for that case, to expand its dominance in the, or, uh, on the internet. We also saw uh, companies, uh, Sears, or an example of a retailer that also uh, uses this technology to, to build, to expand its uh, dominance. So by allowing uh, other uh, software developers to create apps that can facilitate product uh, searches and identify store locations. So there are a couple of uh, factors that have led to increased uh, uh, popularity of uh, APRs, the uh, application programming uh, interface. Uh, one of them is the e explosion of the uh, app market, as we uh, saw in the second or third le lecture that Today, apps have become increasingly uh, popular, and the main building block of, of applications is uh, APIs. That is, through uh, application programming interface, it's possible for uh, apps uh, developers to create uh, these applications uh, around certain uh, platforms. Because the, if you don't know how a particular platform, say uh, Facebook, is working, like the, the, how the mechanism works, then it's very difficult to develop uh, an app that can communicate with this uh, platform. But because companies are opening up, uh, that allows uh, developers to build apps that uh, uh, can interact with this uh, platform. So we know now that uh, apps have really become uh, popular, and those are statistics of uh, applications. That was uh, last year. I think we saw this uh, slide uh, earlier in this class. And these are just some of the stories in the media showing how apps have become uh, popular. So the inc increasing popularity of apps uh, makes APIs even more popular because it's through uh, APIs that developers can create uh, these uh, apps. And when you, you let other people build applications around your platforms, that provides opportunity for you to expand your, 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 your presence on the net because it's through such apps you can reach uh, a wider audience uh, of your uh, target uh, consumers. But another reason that has led to in increase the uh, strategic importance of our APIs is the success of companies that have embraced uh, APIs. The first movers uh, in this uh, new business uh, development approach have proven to be quite successful. So they are those companies that are, are using uh, API strategy 
have appeared to be quite successful. And we have two examples here, and that is Salesforce.com, uh, which has generated nearly 50% of its uh, annual three billion uh, US dollars revenue through APRs. And also Expedia, which has generated about 90% of its uh, two billion US dollars uh, revenue. And there are so many other uh, examples of companies that are benefiting today through APR's uh, strategy. Another factor that uh, has contributed to the increasing strategic importance of APR is the, the wave of acquisitions of companies that manage uh, APR's. We, we know that usually investors are looking for companies that seem to be promising. And because no one wants to invest uh, his or her money in a company that does not promise any return. So the fact that there are larger companies out there that increasingly are going after companies that uh, manage APRs is a, an indication that this is something that is there to stay and it's very promising. So you, you have examples of companies that are, have acquired uh, relatively smaller companies that manage APRs and it's one of the indications that uh, APRs are, are currently shaping the business landscape, but they will continue uh, to shape the, the, the business landscape. And the last uh, uh, factor that it has led to increasing popularity of APRs is the uh, government support uh, of, of this uh, approach. So for instance, uh, President Barack Obama issued a uh, open, uh, open data executive order requiring government agencies to make their data available in open machine readable APRs. So it's, this goes to show that this is something that ap appears uh, important not only in the business environment but also uh, among the uh, government. So to summarize the, the, the importance of, of uh, APRs, there is a quote from James Patton who says uh, APRs are going to be the driver for the digital economy. And unless the companies uh, are already talking about APRs, then they will be left uh, behind. And for uh, a business, all that you need to be aware now is that uh, APRs provide a, a huge potential as a business development tool. And it's something that you need to think about, provide opportunity for other people to develop uh, apps around your platforms, and that will in increase the uh, potential for you to expand your presence here, especially in the web environment. Another technology that I would like to briefly uh, talk about is uh, widgets, and this is Basically, a, a relatively, I would say, a, a small ch a, a chunk of uh, application that is, uh, can be attached either on your desktop or on your website. And it provides certain functionality. It could be providing uh, real-time information, could be a calculator, or any, any other function. So there are multiple um, widgets, whether on our desktop, so you could have it on your uh, we website. And it increasingly, it provides a, an opportunity for companies uh, to interact with uh, uh, consumers. And with this, uh, provide different for uh, they come in different as f different forms of tools. As I said, that can be made available on a website or on your uh, desktop. And they are quite easy uh, because you really don't need any programming skills to, to, to have a widget on your website, on your desktop. But all that you need is ability to copy and, and, and paste. So as a business manager, you, you can uh, uh, use this uh, as a channel to, to, to communicate, to, to interact with your consumers. You, uh, if you have these widgets, you, you, you can ask your business affiliates, you, your partners, to have them on your websites. And they have, they have a kind of viral effect because it's easy for them to, to 
spread. It's easier for consumers to have them on their, uh, say, mobile devices or PC, and they can easily uh, spread. So one of the uh, applications of uh, web widgets that you can use is uh, to allow uh, searches on your site to provide real-time uh, updates on information such as uh, price and even streaming some videos or any content that you can think of. And social media widgets can en encourage site visitors to subscribe to rich sites uh, summary like to get uh, no notifications uh, on changes on, on on the content of your websites so when someone has it on their mobile uh, phone for example they can get updated on whatever changes that you are making on your your site so it's a very cool tool that you you can use to interact with your uh, consumers and keep them updated on whatever is going on in uh, with your business So today, uh, I will continue to, to, to talk about uh, digital business or, or, uh, infrastructure and, and, and technologies, and we will look at uh, cloud computing. So what cloud computing uh, is, uh, put it in very simple terms, is, uh, it involves the use of uh, remote servers and software networks that allow centralized data storage and online access to computer services or resources. So what it, it does is to use distributed uh, storage and uh, computing by processing as a way, uh, as an alternative to physical infrastructure that you would have in your, your uh, organization. So uh, the cloud here refers to the combination of networking, the storage uh, hardware and software that are hosted outside your uh, 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 organization that you can use as uh, infrastructure for carrying out your uh, business uh, data processing. So they provide uh, uh, computing uh, resources that are not tied to a, a particular uh, physical uh, location. So ideally, you. you can think it of uh, the different elements are uh, tied somewhere in the in, in the cloud, and they are comprised of uh, five uh, basic elements, and that is uh, virtual computers or servers, data storage uh, capacity, communication network, and development uh, environment. So it's a fully fledged uh, computing uh, infrastructure that you can use. That is uh, is not tied to a, to a, to a phys physical uh, location, but uh, usually it's provided by an external uh, uh, provider and it provides you with a fully computing uh, capability. So from the user uh, perspective, as I said, uh, the different elements are, uh, that represent the, the services that your provider uh, provides you with are invisible and they are hidden somewhere uh, uh, in the cloud. So, for instance, uh, Amazon uh, uh, provides uh, uh, cloud computing services uh, through their Amazon Web Service called Elastic Compute, uh, Compute Cloud, where you can basically visit and create and rent one, to, uh, one of their virtual servers that are running on Amazon infrastructure. And instead of uh, buying and installing uh, a, a physical uh, server, say, from IBM or HP, you can uh, ask uh, Amazon to, to create a virtual server uh, for you. So instead of having a physical infrastructure installed in your, your premises, you can use uh, this cloud uh, infrastructure. So for an established uh, government uh, uh, organization that is using the traditional the technology, in this case, that the physical infrastructure, Adapting the cloud computing uh, technology is what is referred to as moving to, to, to cloud. And what you do is to move from the CAPEX model. Uh, CAPEX uh, is uh, an abbreviation for capital expenditure model that instead of having dedicated hardware 
infrastructure in your organization, you're moving to OPEX model. That is operating ex expenditure, that you mm -hmm. use uh, cloud uh, resources, computing resources, and you, you pay as per usage. So usually you would subscribe to uh, a certain provider, and instead of having physical uh, computing resources placed in your, your, your in the premises of your organization, you would use uh, cloud computing uh, resources. So transfer from this uh, uh, traditional approach of keeping infrastructure in your organization to using uh, cloud uh, uh, computing uh, processing is what we call moving to, to cloud. So there are a number of benefits that are associated with uh, 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 cloud uh, computing, and this is quite uh, uh, intuitive, uh, some of these. The first one is uh, lowest cost of ownership, or, and this is quite useful for business uh, startups that, that have uh, limited uh, capital. So it allows you to focus on your uh, core business, save your money for doing uh, other activities that are important for taking off your business instead of investing on uh, uh, physical in computing infrastructure for, for, the, uh, for your uh, business. Another uh, benefit is this easily uh, upgraded companies that are providing uh, uh, cloud computing uh, services uh, actually have uh, huge resources. Uh, consider companies like uh, Google, Amazon. So it's uh, quite easy for, 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 for these services to, to be uh, uh, upgraded and the service level is quite high. Productivity anywhere. As I said, the, with cloud computing, you, you, your uh, computing infrastructure is not tied to a specific uh, physical uh, location which means you can access it from wherever you, you are. And this uh, is very useful in increasing uh, productivity of your, your, your business. And likewise, you have off-site uh, data storage. As the storage, uh, the processing is all tied somewhere in the, in the cloud, which means uh, this helps to, to, to protect your, your, your business or potential loss of uh, data through uh, damage or accidents such as fire and alike. You don't need to have uh, IT man maintenance costs because basically you have someone else providing all the infrastructure that you, you need for your uh, data processing. And you can get uh, disaster assistance pretty uh, fairly faster compared to if you are you're maintaining your physical uh, in infrastructure. And Advocates of cloud computing are that it's, uh, y you have a very high guarantee that you will have access to these services almost all the time. Now, last time we, we talked about uh, uh, software as a service, which sometimes could be confused with uh, cloud computing, but these are two uh, completely uh, different uh, uh, concepts. With uh, software as a service, uh, we say this is uh, an, an application. That it's a fully formed uh, application that another uh, provider provides you uh, so that you can use. So instead of having the, the application installed in, in your organization, someone else provide, keeps the, the application for you and you can access it. But cloud computing, is actually a fully fledged computing in infrastructure and services that you can rent. So these are slightly different. They are, they are different uh, terms, and uh, you need to uh, note the, the difference between the, the two. Another concept that we will look at is uh, virtualization. And this is another approach to, to, to managing your, your IT uh, resources e effectively and uh, cost efficient. It improves uh, cost uh, efficiency in many ways as we will look at the different uh, benefits of uh, vi visualization. And basically what it means is uh, the possibility to use uh, the storage and processing uh, ability of one computer to perform the function of other 
uh, uh, c computers. I, I will show you uh, uh, an image that can summarize uh, uh, what visualization really is. So basically, you have a, a computer that is using processing and storage capacity to do the work of uh, another. Uh, uh, this is something that we, even here at the school, you, you, we use, that it's possible to access your computer at school from home. And I think uh, even students uh, uh, do that. So it's a technology that companies uh, ca ca can use. And how it works is um, you actually impose a thin layer of, of software on your ma machine to create visual ma machine that you can access other uh, machines uh, uh, elsewhere. So as I said, it, it basically allows one uh, computer to perform the task of multiple uh, computers by sharing resources of a single computer across multiple environments. So it has a number of uh, benefits. Uh, one of them, as you can imagine, is uh, it reduces uh, costs. If you can use one uh, computer to perform tasks of many other computers, obviously that helps you to cut down your cost in terms of uh, uh, hardware uh, cost. But also it, it helps you to reduce uh, maintenance and support costs. If you can reduce the number of uh, uh, hardware that you need to attend to, this is uh, connected to uh, reduction in uh, maintenance and support costs. It helps to reduce uh, energy uh, costs, scalability to add more resources more easily, ability to uh, expand the res resources that you can use uh, for your business. Standardized personalized desktop can be accessed from any location, so gives uh, flexibility uh, uh, with respect to usage of your resources. And uh, in connection to that, it helps to improve uh, business uh, continuity with, re uh, with regard to uh, flexibility that it, it provides. So we will look at uh, another concept, and that is uh, service-oriented uh, architecture. So basically, what this means is the collection of, uh, it's, an, uh, it's an approach to, to creating uh, software where uh, individual modules of software are, are designed in such a way that they can interact uh, independently w w with one a a another. They can communicate uh, with one another independent of the uh, platforms. So it, it's uh, actually uh, an approach to, to designing uh, or, uh, a, uh, a software or uh, to architecting uh, a software. So there are a couple of uh, features of uh, s uh, software uh, or uh, service-oriented uh, uh, architecture, and one of them is, uh, it is it, it, uh, the interface is independent of the platform. So this kind of uh, design of uh, software is independent of uh, which uh, platform uh, the user is going uh, to, to, to apply. So it's not tied to specific operating system or to specific uh, hardware. And that gives you uh, flexibility uh, in, in that case. And it's uh, possible, as I said, for, for it to interact with other uh, software uh, independently, and this helps it uh, because it, it can interact with, with other uh, software. Then, independently, then it's possible for for them uh, to to be to to be self-contained and to not be influenced by by the, the to be affected by those other uh, software that are communicating with. So there are uh, a number of uh, benefits that are associated with uh, service-oriented uh, architecture, and that are connected to its ability to operate independent of the, uh, of the uh, platform. And these uh, include uh, Im improving information flow for, for an organization. So if you have different uh, uh, software that can communicate with, with one another freely in a, in a loosely coupled way, it helps to easily uh, speed up information flow. And also, uh, location transparency. Usually, these softwares are located in a 
directory that users can easily locate and if they are shifted it's also easy for, for users to, to track uh, where the, the software is. It helps to organize uh, the, the software and provides uh, better data uh, translation. So basically it's a design of uh, software uh, uh, creation that can be uh, created in small modules that are capable of uh, interacting with one another, uh, communicating with one another I I independently. So now we will move on to look at uh, management of internet uh, service and uh, hosting providers. So we know that usually in order to have access to internet, you will need uh, a company out there to provide you, uh, to provide you with a connection uh, to, 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 the, to, to the internet. And those companies that provide you with access to internet connection are what we call ISPs, that internet service uh, providers. And in some cases, ISPs, uh, internet uh, uh, service providers will, will also uh, pr maybe host you, your website, but it's not uh, uh, always the case. So in that case, there are times that maybe you may need a specialized company that will host your, your, your uh, website or any other e-business services. And those are the companies that we call hosting providers. Now, since these are companies that uh, provide, uh, host your website, other e-business, and provide you with connection uh, to the internet, it's very important uh, to have a, 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 a proper approach to selection of these uh, companies. So we will look at, sorry, Infrastructure is uh, the physical components in, the, in that case, but in, 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 in this uh, cause we also refer to the software that is attached to the hardware and the network. So all this together, they form uh, e-business infrastructure. But architecture is the, the design, uh, an approach to designing something. So in this case, is uh, architecture of software. It's an approach to designing software. So when we talk about uh, service-oriented uh, uh, architecture, we refer to approach to designing software in small modules that can communicate uh, with one another. So basically, architecture is an, an approach to design, while infrastructure is the combination of uh, hardware, software, and network that provide uh, companies with computing uh, capability. So we are looking at uh, internet service uh, providers and hosting uh, providers. And since these uh, play a critical role to the success of our businesses, it's very important to, to have a, a clear uh, procedure and appropriate procedure for, for their selection. So b before we, we, we look at uh, uh, different approaches to, to selection of uh, all different factors to, to consider when it comes to selection of uh, internet service providers and hosting providers, we will look at uh, different methods through which we can connect to the internet. And this is uh, a traditional approach, a dial-up dial uh, uh, connection, which is now getting out of date, but is still uh, used in some places, especially in the uh, remote areas where uh, broadband connection uh, installations are not uh, uh, available. So. With this approach, uh, the access uh, to the internet is obtained through telephone lines using analog uh, uh, modems. As I said, it's becoming less and less popular, but still, in some places, they are still used, especially in remote areas. So if you l look at it, uh, this is a, a, a picture that illustrates how it works. So you have uh, the internet, you have the service uh, provider that helps you uh, to connect with the internet, but the connection uh, is available through telephone uh, lines. Now, 
the opposite of this uh, broadband connection, which is now much more uh, dominant. This is what we uh, use. But I say still, dial up connection is still uh, uh, used in some places. So with broadband connection, it's, uh, this is a wide band with uh, data transmission with an ability to simultaneously transport multiple signals and traffic types. And so here we can obtain uh, internet connection through uh, ma media such as coaxial cable, optical fiber, twisted pair, wireless broadband, and it, it is much faster than uh, the, the, the other one, the dial-up co co connection. And it's, this is much more uh, dominant uh, today because of the high speed it, uh, it, it provides, prov uh, making it possible to access a rich content such as videos and others. And this is a picture il illustrating a uh, connection of internet through uh, broadband. So there are a number of factors that you need to consider when you assess an internet service uh, provider. The first one is speed of access. And that is, uh, it's very important that uh, you obtain your services from a provider that can guarantee high speed to, to, uh, of access. And that is because according to, to, to studies, and th this is one of the studies that uh, uh, where uh, users said if the performance of, of the uh, internet in, in terms of uh, speed is poor, then they are likely to not uh, visit a particular website or a particular uh, e retailer. So the, the speed o of the internet will affect uh, the performance of your site and in, in turn this will perform uh, will affect the performance of your business because customers do not like this so it's very important that you obtain your services from a provider that is able to provide high speed of, uh, of access so this is uh, w what i've been uh, uh, talking about is uh, speed and one thing that you need to to, to consider in this case uh, when it comes to uh, internet service provider is whether uh, the the server that you are served with is dedicated or shared D dedicated is that the server hosts content only for you and shared is when the server is used by many other uh, businesses and as you can guess Usually, when you have a, sh a shared server, the, its performance will be relatively lower than a dedicated server. But that has cost implications. When you want to have a, a dedicated server, it's, more, it's obviously that you have to pay more for that. And this could be difficult for especially startups or uh, 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 online businesses. So in most cases, you, you would go for shared uh, uh, services, but still you need to take uh, precautions. You need to make assessment to ensure that it doesn't compromise the uh, speed uh, of, your, uh, of your services. Another factor that you need to, to consider is uh, uh, availability. Uh, that is uh, availability of the, of the services. So you want to go to a, a provider that can guarantee uh, availability of their services and that means this w will mean the, the availability of your services to your consumers as well. And with respect to this, there is what we call service uh, level agreements that usually they are, you enter into a contract with your service uh, provider. And uh, as part of these contracts, service uh, standards will be specified that he will commit uh, himself or herself to the level of uh, service uh, that uh, he will uh, provide to you. So usually uh, service uh, level agreement will contain aspects such as uh, the, the average time that you should expect between failures and in case failure happens, how fast they can fix the, the, the problem and which part is responsible for alerting the other one with respect to, 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 to faults or uh, failures. So it provides specification to 
the kind of relationship you have between <laughs> you and your uh, service uh, provider, and it provides terms of the uh, of the business or terms of uh, of the contractual relationship between the two of you. And the service provider is bound by these terms that they have to deliver their services according to to the agreement. So it's very important that uh, you go through this agreement uh, each time you have. Uh, uh, a relationship with the service provider, you will have an agreement and you have to be keen to the uh, terms of uh, services that uh, are entered. It's most of us uh, tend to be, uh, when it comes to contracts, we are not so much, we don't like uh, going into details, but it's very important when it comes to such uh, critical uh, services to be aware of all the terms that uh, are specified between you and the service uh, provider, and make sure that these are in favor of your, your, your business. Another issue that you need to consider is security, that this is someone that is uh, providing you with services from outside. So for instance, if people are hold, uh, hosting a website for you, you have to make sure that the services they provide you are secure, that your, 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 your information is secure and uh, outsiders, hackers, they cannot, they cannot access and do malicious things you know, with your, your data. So it's very important to, to make sure that you act, uh, approach service providers that can guarantee uh, a reasonable level of uh, security. Another, another factor is cost, and this is quite obvious, especially for small and medium uh, enterprises, that you need, we, considering all these other factors that we have talked about, it's also important to, to consider uh, relative costs that you will incur by, from different uh, service uh, providers. And the cost could be uh, setup fees, rental fees or software calls, technical support, whatever costs that uh, will be associated with contracting a particular uh, uh, internet service uh, provider. So you need to make sure that uh, uh, you, you approach uh, a provider that it provides you the services with a reasonable cost, but also you mm -hmm. need to consider the other factors that we have uh, discussed uh, in this class. Now, in connection to, to the internet and internet service providers, uh, we also review again intranets. We, we, we talked about this in the in introduction, but we also look a little bit more on the, on the intranets. And as we said uh, during the introduction of this course, intranets are private networks uh, within organization that um, uh, outsiders cannot uh, Access so they provide uh, opportunity for organizations uh, to to internally share information, operational systems, or computing services inside uh, the, the organization. So when you have a, a, a network that is limited within your organization, that's what we call uh, uh, internet, and they are quite useful in supporting the sales side, uh, e-commerce. That is interaction between you and your uh, consumers not in terms of consumers accessing the internet, but in terms of internal operations that are uh, useful in delivering services to consumers. So there are a number of uh, benefits uh, of having uh, intranets. And one of them is uh, reducing product uh, life cycle. Uh, and that is because whenever you have an intranet, it uh, facilitates information sharing within an organization, and this is quite uh, useful when it comes to information that are relevant for new products uh, development, that staff, uh, employees within our organization can easily uh, interact, can easily communicate uh, with, with one another and speed up uh, the, the process of product development. But also, it helps to improve uh, productivity uh, within an organization. With internet, it's possible for employees to locate and look at the information that is coming up within an organization and quickly uh, respond uh, uh, to, to, to whatever that is needed to be done. 
It also enhances co collaboration uh, since with internet is uh, employees within an organization are connected to one another, then it's easier for people in different uh, functional areas, different departments within an organization to collaborate. It also provides uh, better customer uh, service in terms of uh, speeding up uh, uh, response to uh, customer needs and uh, demands because of the, as I said earlier, possibility for uh, employees within an organization to, to communicate or different functional uh, areas to uh, communicate uh, with one another. And also for organizations that have uh, different uh, locations, then it's easier for, for information to be shared even to uh, departments or uh, sections or extension of the, uh, of the organization that are located in other uh, places or even uh, globally. And this again helps to improve collaboration between uh, different departments or different uh, sections or different uh, sister companies of the same uh, organization. And then and since most of the uh, applications are delivered uh, through the web, then it provides opportunity to main maintain uh, uh, the services at a very uh, lower cost. The opposite of intranets is uh, extranets. And as we said uh, uh, in the introductory uh, lecture that this is a sort of extension of your intranet to authorize uh, third parties. So it could be extension of the intranet to other business, to other business partners, or to your uh, consumers. So for instance, when we buy the, uh, Amazon or any other uh, online retailer, allow you to open up uh, an account and they keep your in information and you you can access some information that someone that doesn't have an account with Amazon cannot. That's a form of extranet. So you are extending your intranet to outsiders, be it consumers or your uh, business partners, so that they can access certain information. But not everyone on the internet can access unless they have uh, authorization from uh, your part. So there are also a number of uh, benefits of uh, uh, extras. Uh, one is information sharing, whether it's with your consumers or with other business uh, partners. Uh, it helps you to, to share information uh, with them in a secure way because with extranet, not everyone, uh, as I said, on the internet can have access to that information. O only those outsiders that are granted permission. But also it helps to reduce uh, cost because processes can be made more efficient through an uh, extranet. So y you can imagine when you have uh, when you have when you have integrated your your uh, information sharing system with say a, a partner in the uh, supply chain how much you can save in terms of uh, cost because it's easy to to update say your suppliers or your distribution agents uh, in real time w w without uh, actually say moving physical documents or sending someone uh, to deliver information uh, they can actually follow up changes and uh, updates in your organization in real time without necessarily uh, involving uh, people to facilitate that communication. So they are actually, uh, effectively, they are becoming part of your organization with respect to, to the function with, with which they are uh, associated. And also, it's a, a, a very uh, effective way of uh, customer service. Wh wh when, for instance, we make uh, companies allow us to open up uh, accounts with them and they can keep our information. Uh, for instance, when you, you repeat a, a purchase, you don't need to enter all the information again. They, you just have uh, to log in and they ha already have all your information. But also, it's possible for them over time to, to have understanding of our needs and tailor or customer, uh, customize uh, their services to to make, to, to make them relevant for us, to, to fit uh, into our needs. S 
So it's one o'clock, we can take a break and then we meet uh, later, after 15 minutes. <laughs>